Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out this evening to our Heat Smart Meet the Installer event. Um, we're really pleased to um, begin the Heat Smart program here in Winchester. And uh, my name is Fritzi Nace, and I'm going to ask our town energy conservation coordinator, Susan McPhee, just to say a few words about how this program fits into the larger um, Winchester goals for energy conservation. Thank you, Fritzi, and welcome. Uh, this is a cooperative program with Arlington. Winchester and Arlington are getting together uh, for the first time, we hope it's not the last time, to try to take on residential heating and cooling. So this is really exciting. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, this fits within a larger framework of Winchester's history at the municipal level of taking on energy conservation efforts. We've done lots and lots of projects on the town side, on the residential side. We were a pilot community for Solarize Mass, bringing residential solar to Winchester. And this program is sort of similar to uh, Solarize Mass. We're really excited to kick it off. Um, and I'd like to just give you a tiny framework, which is of residential carbon footprint. So we're a bedroom community, 85% of Winchester's carbon comes from the residential sector. Within that, if each home looks roughly like 30% comes from electricity, 40% from transportation, and 30% from heating. So if we can tackle the heating piece and start to look at changing the conversation from fossil fuel fossil fuels to uh, clean fuels, then that's 30% of our carbon footprint in each and every home. So that's what we're here to do. We're gonna change the conversation. We're gonna talk about other ways to heat and cool your home, and they can be very economic, and they are also more comfortable. So with that, I'll turn it back to Fritzi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan, and I imagine most of you know all the great work that she's done in Winchester to conserve energy and save the town money, so that's awesome. Um, and as Susan mentioned, um, volunteers and municipal representatives from the towns of Winchester and Arlington have been working hard the past several months to learn about these technologies ourselves um, and also to read the proposals by the installers who are interested in being part of the program. We've interviewed and vetted installers, and tonight we're really pleased to introduce those installers that we've chosen to work with in the HeatSmart 2019 program. For air source heat pumps, we are working with New England Duckless, and we will hear from Joe Wood, who's the uh, co-owner. For ground source heat pumps, we will be working with Energy Smart Alternatives, and we'll hear from Melanie Head, co-owner. Our modern wood heat installer will be Kaliui, uh, and the owner and director is Mark Kaliui. And for solar hot water, we'll be working with New England Solar Hot Water, and we'll hear from their president, John Moore. Um, each installer will have about 10 minutes to tell us more about their technology, share some pictures of installations, and uh, talk briefly about pricing. There will be five minutes after each presentation to have some questions about that technology. And we'll ask you to use the microphones that are at the center here. Um, my colleague Arlington's coach, Andy Winslow, will help us um, just organize ourselves with the microphones. After the individual presentations, um, we will have um, about 20 minutes for more question and answers. Um, so, after that, then we will retire to the entryway where each installer has a table set up. You can go to that um, particular technology, ask questions, and you can also sign up there for more information or to have a site visit in your home. Um, and you only need to sign on one sheet. There are sheets sort of spread around, so if you sign on one, um, you don't need to sign the others. There are places where you can indicate which technologies you're interested in. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to hearing a little bit more. And first, um, we'll hear from Meg Howard, who is the Heat Smart Program Manager from Mass Clean Energy Center, one of the co-sponsors of the program, along with the Mass Department of Energy Resources. She's going to give us an overview of the Heat Smart Program. Okay. 
Thanks, Fritzi. Uh, as Fritzi said, I'm going to give a quick overview of what the Heat Smart program is, a little background, uh, but I will try and be quick so that we can get on to the main event of the evening hearing from all of our installers. Uh, so, first, what is Heat Smart? Um, it's a program that's run by the state uh, in individual towns uh, and cities with the goal of increasing community awareness and adoption of clean heating and cooling. So that works through this kind of community whole purchasing model where uh, um, we, the kind of hexagon uh, to the far uh, right uh, as a state, uh, solicit towns that are interested and then we get um, community organizers from each town uh, including Fritzi, uh, Susan as a municipal rep, and, and then a number of other volunteers who are here in the audience tonight uh, and who've already done an enormous amount of work uh, and will continue to do so. And then all of you coming to events tonight uh, to meet the installers um, who will be offering you um, free site assessments if they have a conversation and, and, it's, and you kind of mutually agree that it would be of interest to you. Um, that kind of standardized pricing uh, and uh, this round of Heat Smart is four towns, or four groups of towns. Uh, as you know, Arlington and Winchester are working together. Uh, Belmont has its own campaign. Hudson and Stowe also have a campaign. And then Marshfield is the fourth town. In the second round of Heat Smart, there was an earlier pilot round last year, uh, which also had four groups of communities. Um, you heard a little bit of which installer we have for each of these technologies, but the four installers we're talking about when we talk about clean heating and cooling are air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, modern wood heating, and solar hot water. So why uh, is the state here caring about clean heating and cooling? Uh, the big reason is greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, if you look at this uh, chart of emissions in our state, over a quarter of the emissions in our state come from space and water heating. Um, so it's really a significant chunk. And, you know, we have made advances in electricity, you know, transportation is another question, but in order to hit the state's aggressive greenhouse gas reduction targets of 80% by 2050, we're really going to have to start making serious strides in that space heating, space and water heating wedge. Uh, and so we're hoping the technologies we present tonight will offer exciting solutions, not only for the greenhouse gas benefits, but for superior quality and comfort, uh, hopefully some opportunity for decreased operational costs, as well as, of course, the greenhouse gas benefits. Um, so more on that topic, this is a slide that shows the relative emissions uh, of air source and ground source heat pumps um, compared to with today's um, uh, energy mix. So uh, today, kind of the standard grid mix is about 20% renewable. Arlington and Winchester both have community choice aggregation, which um, I think is a, maybe a smidge higher, more renewable. And then if you offer the option of 100% renewable, uh, which both towns offer and I believe are, are widely used, then those emission spars uh, go to zero. Or similarly, if you have solar PV in your home that can offset uh, the heat pumps, they would also go to zero. Um, wood pellets is the fuel for modern wood heating, again, below any of the fossil fuel options. Uh, and solar hot water, just kind of minimal input energy used to, to circulate the pumps, and then you get the free solar energy. So you're going to hear a lot more about each of the technologies from the installer, but I just want to share a few kind of overarching things for everyone to keep in mind. One um, is there's financing available for all four of these technologies through the Mass Save Heat Loan. So it's a great 0% interest uh, over seven years, up to $25,000, available for all four of these technologies. Um, you get it by working with local banks. Uh, you have to have had a home energy assessment within the last two years to qualify for this loan. And one other kind of thing to keep in mind is it often makes sense to bundle if you're doing a clean heating and cooling technology with some uh, home weatherization to bundle those all as one loan uh, since each residence just gets one loan. So it makes sense to kind of put them all together. Uh, so next steps today, um, think about signing up for a home energy assessment if you haven't had one within the last two years. Uh, Go ahead and do those efficiency upgrades. You know, take advantage of the heat loan, but also before you're putting in new heating and cooling technology, weatherization upgrades are just going to help you right size it and save money on the clean heating and cooling. 
Uh, and then sign up uh, today out of those tables to hear from these selected installers. Um, if you sign up, they'll reach out starting with a phone call and kind of talk about next steps. Um, and if, if it's mutually agreeable, they'll come out for a site visit. Um, so here's our installers again, as Fritzy introduced, and I believe we're going to start uh, by hearing from New England Douglas about air source heat pumps. Good evening, my name is Joseph Wood. I'm here with my coworker Brian Kelly from New England Douglas. Thank you for having us tonight. Uh, thank you to the Mass CDC and the volunteers who have helped get this program this far. We hope to carry it much further. Uh, we do ductless air source heat pumps and ducted air source heat pumps. And um, those units, we have a, a demo outside that gives a display, but traditionally what you're looking at is an indoor unit that is wall mounted or some other variety of that in an outdoor unit. And as discussed, they don't use any fossil fuel, they use electricity, but not electricity like a toaster would where it turns on and generates you know, heating in a coil. What's happening is the heat pumps move heat from one space to another, similar to the way a window air conditioner absorbs heat from the space that it's in and rejects it to the outdoors. And the, the funny part about that is that heat pumps have always kind of been a, a bad word in New England. I was talking to someone outside about that because their reputation was at 35 degrees. The fall off was just tremendous, and that was true. The products that we're discussing today are a whole new class of product that are designed to be a primary heating source. So I wanted to kind of address that on the front end and, and say I'm also someone who uses them as a primary heat source in my home, so really great products. Uh, we do believe not only in the products that we have, but the clean energy, everything that's represented on stage tonight is the future. It has to be the future to make some change in, in heat in a more clean manner. As a company, we work to practice the golden rule, meaning that we're going to treat all of our customers the way we want to be treated, and you know, we as consumers want to be treated. The installations that we will do for the residents of Winchester and, and really anyone, but of course as part of this program, are going to be market leading. We won't leave out anything that you guys need. Uh, and you can expect from us great workmanship, our values being you know, put out there every day in the, in the field, uh, you know, respect and integrity and community action, and uh, the technology that we bring to the table will be great as well. I am the owner, along with my wife, Laura Wood. I'm a plumber by trade and have done lots of boilers and plumbing work and came to Duckless because it's something I've been going to the to the seminars put on by Mitsubishi and other vendors where they talk about what's going on and well for many of us in this room it may be a new thing, it's something that the rest of the world kind of leapfrogged other technologies like radiators and baseboard heat and went right to Duckless in India and much of Asia. This is eighty five to ninety percent of the heat, same with much of South America. It's a great way, you know, Mitsubishi had a clever commercial where they showed someone turning on the faucet and every faucet in the home turned on. And that is the way, traditionally, unfortunately, we use heating in the United States. And that comes from the era which heat was kind of produced, which was in the early 1900s, late 1800s, as we transitioned into coal and things like that. Um, Alex is our install manager. Uh, if you call in and make an appointment or have us perform an installation, you'll certainly be working with her. She's great. She's a wonderful resource. Brian's in the back. I don't think it's appropriate for me to point the laser at him, but he's there in an orange shirt like myself. Um, and I kind of talked about this earlier, but do these systems really work? Absolutely. They're designed to provide 100% of whatever they were rated to give you, which is you know, BTUs down at 5 degrees Fahrenheit. And there is a bit of a draw off, but at the worst point, these units will still produce 75% of whatever they were rated for. And I guess for everyone here, you don't really need to think about it because we'll do that for you. It's part of a size and calculation we'll perform to make sure that you guys have a system that's sized correctly. Um, and I noted down the bottom that we do have many installations, including my own, my kids' rooms. Uh, the last five years, it's only ductless there. As I've said before, we have a gas pressure problem. I have a boiler in my home as well. There's a gas pressure problem in my neighborhood. You know, when we're down at five degrees, it's very interesting that my gas actually peters out. I'm like the last person to get gas, apparently. And it's my heat pumps that keep my house warm. So uh, definitely goes uh, against what some people may think, but I want to really kind of uh, realize it's, it's, a, it's a great product. As you have us to your homes, we will offer firm pricing. It's something I'm a consumer as well, and I don't want to ask for money twice or, or um, not disclose something on the front end unless there's something that's a total anomaly, like we opened up a wall and there was you know, a steel beam in there or something like that. 
your price will always be firm and every job will be priced individually. There's a pricing guide online which has what we call base pricing and uh, that has uh, certain parameters like 25 feet of pipe per zone, stuff like that. Uh, but what we'll do when we come out to your home is give you a firm price and just make sure that you have a clear understanding of anything that might have cost more like an electric panel upgrade or if we're doing Wi-Fi or something like that. Um, they, they note here that the base price was a standard installation. Um, I did make up some case studies, I suppose you could call them, that show different installations that we did and, and uh, changes or challenges that made the price go up a little bit above base. This is a really nice home in Weymouth that we did. And you'll notice right here that there's actually a line coming down. That line ran underneath and behind to the outdoor unit, which is on that side. Um, in fact, it's on the back side of this wall. This is a multi-zone system. This is an example of a job that would, would have above base pricing because the piping ran beneath the house. Uh, but this home is in an area that sees storm surges and the boiler is suspended from the ceiling down in the basement. It's kind of an unusual setup that it's just normal that the system takes on water. So everything that we installed had to be up and elevated and things like that. Um, but a great house, but also if you notice the window design, these are all casement type windows here, the type that you can't put a window unit in anyway. So even though this house, if you stepped onto the front porch and looked out, it was a breathtaking view. It was not very comfortable. And uh, this system here had, you know, additional piping. I, I pressed the wrong button, piping, uh, some panel upgrades, extra pipe there. Uh, the system that we installed is a three zone outdoor, but there were only two zones inside, so the customer can add a third at a later date because she was a single person and didn't need all of them. So this job represents about a $1,200 increase due to those adders that are listed there. This is a home in Milton that we did. Um, You'll see they have a outdoor unit hanging out right here with the double fans that indicates it's four zones or greater. There's piping running up the side here and it's inside of a saloon duct conduit which you can actually see some of it here and some of it here. The securing the brick obviously requires multiple you know, anchors to be set and things like that. This was a fair amount above a base price because the home was not standard at all. We used a, uh, like a cherry picker type truck to get our crew to work safely up at the elevations and stuff. And this repeated on the other side of the house, which I don't have an image of, but um, we, you know, we'd go through the brick, we'd core through it. So this was a job that had a significant amount of stuff to increase. It was around 7,200 above the base price, but again, disclosed on the front end. We also used a, a, a cool item. I was, I was speaking to someone outside about New England architecture, where you have you know multiple small rooms sometimes. And, there's a question about whether or not you should put a ductless unit in every single room. And, and an item that we've used a number of times is called an air share. And it's similar in concept to a bathroom fan. It just uses the wall cavity to transfer air from one space to the next. So a way that we try to find a solution to provide cooling and heating to a, a not really high use space, like a lot, I think it was a large walk-in closet. Oh, there it was, that was it. Um, this is a home in Melrose that we did. Uh, People always ask about, you know, how we run the pipes. We run a two and a half inch hole. I took a picture here because it's kind of funny. I drilled the hole and right on the other side is a cat looking at me. <laughs> Looks like I won't see this very often. But um, you'll see in the master unit here, they kind of entered the master through these French doors. It's the third floor. In this home, I mean, if you look at the home right there, it's, it's radiators. You can tell from a mile away that home has radiators and an old heating system and all this stuff. And in the person who just moved in, who was a baby on, or he just had a baby at the time we moved in. Ripping apart this nicely renovated home was not gonna be a great solution. We solved all this with uh, ductless, you know, and, and this is something we did this job inside of maybe three or four days. The outdoor unit located back here, the pipes come up in a white, we call it some duct, it's kind of the brand, but a unit there, a unit there. This was one of the systems they had. It was a four zone originally, and they added a fifth as we went along because they were really happy with the way the install was going. That's where the fifth zone went. So it's, it's pretty discreet the way it's installed. Uh, they upgraded to the FH series indoor units, which are like a kind of a, just a better indoor unit. It has an optical sensor to tell if you're in the room or not. It's pretty pretty nice. Uh, Twenty three hundred dollars above base for this sort of job, but extra piping. Um, we had to remove shrubs, stuff like that. Um, but the whole name, New England Duckless, you know, we do duck work as well. I think the reason that we normally lead with duckless is because duct work takes electricity to push air through it. And it's generally speaking, that's, that's why the rest of the world doesn't use duct work unless it's institutionally, because it's more efficient not to. The most efficient units will be your wall mounts. But if you have duct work, 
don't fear, there are definitely many, many solutions available. Mitsubishi, uh, LG, train that we offer as well. They have products that are cold climate air source heat pumps, which are the sort that uh, Meg Howard and her team want to see and that the whole um, heat smart team want to see the type that are designed for the environment we live in. Uh, we're happy to be here. Our pricing is very, very competitive and we're standing by ready to help. So I want to thank everyone for having us. That's our number there. I don't actually put it out there much, but 781-995-COOL. And um, our website you can sign up on. And, and thank you guys for having me. Appreciate it. We have a couple minutes if anyone has a specific question for Joe. And um, you can either come to the microphone or uh, Andy can help you get your question. Anybody, anybody have a question over here? I'm going to see if the, the microphone will reach, but it might not. Where is the hand up? <coughs> so, would you, if somebody didn't have the other heating system, <coughs> would you get an auxiliary system with it, or this is the only thing you'd need? Um, to make sure I understand, was your question if you can use this as your only system? Was that well, I mean, I, I don't know how cold it gets, right? I actually sort of new in the area, but, you know, if it gets down to 10 below, it probably happens occasionally. And if this is all you had, how would your house be doing? Yeah, uh, a good question. So the temperature you referred to, you know, if you look at historical temperatures and stuff, New England, while it's a cold area, it doesn't really get that cold. What we normally get is wind chill, and that's a human sensation from moisture coming off the surface of your skin, but luckily these are all machines and they don't, they don't feel that. So we're talking like a pure thermometer temperature, and um, even seeing zero is, is pretty unusual. I have um, an uncle in Bartlett, New Hampshire, which is right at uh, the, the Kangamangas and Bear Notch Road, where they close the highway, that 29 mile stretch, the 26 or 29 mile stretch. And he switched from um, wood, which was laborious for him, to air source heat pumps. And they're, they're actually really seeing temperatures like you're describing. And it works great because those periods in time, even when cause they say that they work to negative 13 on paper, but we've, we've talked to the engineers and trainings, they actually cut off at negative 18. And the reason for that isn't because the units can't perform, but it's because the wires were rated in the United States by the underwriters laboratory, and they're not designed to apparently. So they'll cut off at, at like negative 18, they'll actually shut down. But that period of time is probably like two to three in the morning maybe, or something like that. So I think it's a scenario that we just haven't seen. Okay, okay, so then another question is, what if somebody really didn't want to have to worry about that? Is there any kind of auxiliary system they could have? Yeah, there definitely are. I mean, you may keep what you already had as a backup if that was a concern, but um, you know, what I would probably be asking that person at that time is what we can do to make their house tighter anyway, because no matter which of the technologies you might choose to use, it's important to keep what you paid to make. So the mass save audit would hopefully help tighten up the envelope of your home a bit more anyway, so that wouldn't be an issue because you shouldn't be rapidly losing heat anyway, that that, that would be a concern. But yeah, there are um, systems that you can install as part of the ductive components that have like auxiliary heat. Um, I try not to use them because they're going to be pure electric. You know, so it's not something we run into very often, the need that is. If I may, how do you handle aluminum siding? Aluminum siding, we drill it in reverse to make the hole. It's, we try to do that even with vinyl siding to make sure because the, the bit that we use has you know, sharp teeth on it that going forward can be aggressive and damage it. And I think maybe where you're going with that is that aluminum, you're not getting it anymore, so you have to be very careful with it so you don't damage it or something. Is that what you were getting at? Yes, and the uh, better half is particularly concerned with the appearance. Yep. So the, uh, the conduit that you run all the pipes within, commonly called slim duct, would basically everything behind is weather tight. There's a, a telescoping sleeve that makes it so any water coming down the wall can't make it inwards. So it's something we do it all the time. The harder ones would be like asbestos tile, which we still deal with, or cement, and I'm sorry, uh, brick as you saw before, but we do it all. Thank you. You're welcome. I have two questions. Yes. If you have an antiquated air conditioning system mm -hmm. with, with ducts, can this replace yes. the system? Yeah, so they make, you know, what most people think of a central air unit, something maybe as, as wide as this lectern and maybe about the same dimensions. 
they make products that can go right in there. We've done a few of those during the last HeatSmart program we did with the uh, Concord Carlisle Lincoln because the home construction out there, a lot more ductwork. And yeah, there's, there's really efficient systems because these systems are more efficient both for air conditioning and for heating than anything you can buy in the standard market. And like our bedroom gets cold. I'm so, sorry? Let's say our bedroom gets mm -hmm. cold. Yep. So we have to turn off the heat for the whole second floor. Like would this be solved? So if you have an issue where like one room is a problem, it's more likely it's the ductwork and not the primary engine, you know? But um, you may be a candidate for something where you take off that trouble room or maybe a room you use all the time and put a ductless unit there so you've got your own zone for that one room and leave the rest of it on the ducted system. It's a hybrid system, they call that, but it's a bit of a better way to do it for maybe what you're describing. Uh, just to clarify how this system works, you have a, a heat pump on the outside yep. and the piping running into the house on yep. the side of the house. Uh, is that carrying hot water or, or air? It's carrying refrigerant, so uh, you know, in the same way that a window you'd have, so I don't know, kind of, you know, you, you have a hot room. The refrigerant, we think of water, boils at 212 and freezes at 32. The refrigerant that's in these pipes is a liquid just like that, but it boils and freezes at way, way different temperatures. So even though to us zero degrees is cold, to the refrigerant it's feeling pretty toasty. So the refrigerant will repeatedly absorb heat from one space and just push it to another place. That's why they call it a heat pump. And the, the compressor, technically, it is kind of like a pump. It just moves refrigerant. And it's the same way that your uh, car's radiator works. At some periods, it's picking up heat from the radiator. and other periods, it's projecting. OK, so, so it's reversible in the summer. Correct, yeah. Yep. Okay. yeah. So hello, uh, my name is Melanie Head, and I'm the co-owner of Energy Smart, and we're the ground source heat pump installers for the Heat Smart program. Um, and my business partner Jamie is in the front row here. He's available for questions afterwards as well. So I'll be using uh, the term geothermal interchangeably with ground source heat pump. It's really the same thing. It's just a different uh, nomenclature. So it it's really just another heat pump. Uh, it, so uh, it's just another way of moving heat from one place to another. But instead of using air, like the air source heat pumps, we're using the ground as a heat source and a heat sink. So around here, the ground temperature is about 50 degrees, and the, which makes it an ideal temperature for heating or air conditioning. The heat is being transferred to, the, to and from the ground. So unlike a uh, combustion-based heating system, we actually can achieve three, four, five hundred percent efficiency. And what that means is for every unit of electricity that a ground source heat pump uses, it moves four or five units of heat. Um, we actually steal heat for free from the ground. And that's where that's why we can achieve such high efficiencies. Uh, electricity, electric heat, is 100% efficient, but it's very, very expensive. So while we're still using electricity, we're taking advantage of the constant temperature of the Earth to achieve these kinds of efficiencies. We're really looking for a ducted system. So we can um, retrofit existing ductwork, or we can install all new ductwork if you do not have a ducted system already. Um, it's not really compatible at all with steam radiators or hot water baseboards. We just cannot make hot water hot enough to get good heat transfer out of these kinds of technologies. It's also not compatible with uh, a property that has a retaining wall or a very steep driveway or steep slope where we can't get a drill rig onto the property. So we have, uh, we install these systems with water well drilling trucks. This is a 35 foot long, 70,000 pound map truck that we have to be able to get all the way onto the property. Now that's not to say we can't fit into really tight spaces. These are two examples where there was barely enough room to get the truck onto the property. So we're really looking for a space of about 50 feet long, 
by 15 feet wide at an absolute minimum with no underground or overhead obstacles. So the gas line, cable, electrical, all of those things need to be identified so we don't hit them. Here's another one. This, this is a house in uh, Belmont that we did where we drilled about eight feet away from the foundation. So we can get into some pretty tight spots. This is what a ground source heat pump looks like. The one on the left is uh, the heat pump and the blower as one machine. So it's, we call this a package unit. It's all one piece of equipment. Now if we have to put a blower or an air handler somewhere else in the house, like in the attic, you'd get uh, one of these little ones on the right. This is called a split system. So that uh, split system goes in the basement and it gets connected to an air handler located somewhere else. And here's an example of one that we installed in Groton. Um, they had a boiler. Um, we did this installation in the winter time, so we left the boiler in place until we were able to install the ducted system. And then once we were done, the boiler was removed. So the ground source heat pump becomes the sole source of heating and air conditioning for the house. There's no fossil fuel required. And here's another before and after. This is a house that already had ductwork in place. So the before picture, there's your standard 30-year-old uh, furnace. We took that out and we put it into ground source heat pump system right in its place. So um, a job like this goes very quick. It's actually only like four or five days of work. There are different types of ground source heat pump systems. This is the most common type that we do. It's called a vertical closed loop. So um, we like this system because once the grass grows back, you don't see anything. There's nothing sticking up in your lawn, um, and all moving parts are in the basement. So you don't have to worry about a pump that's underground. It's just pipes. The, this is another kind of closed loop system. This is kind of what people think of when they think of ground source heat pumps or geothermal loops. Um, this is called like a slinky or a horizontal system. I don't anticipate we'll really be doing any of these just because of the space requirements and rocks. Here's a couple of photo examples. So the vertical closed loop, this is this picture on the uh, left. This is what it looks like before everything gets buried. So the driller comes, they drill a couple holes, they put the pipes down the holes, and they leave them sticking out of the ground, and then we come back and bury them later. And then on the right there is your typical kind of slinky system. Now there are pond systems, but I'm only aware of one pond loop in this entire state, and I, I think it'd be very difficult to get permanent <laughs> for a system like this. Um, and nobody owns the pond, so uh, I don't anticipate we'll be doing any of these in Winchester. Um, there's also open loop systems. Um, we've done a few of these, we don't do a lot. Um, this is a system where you're actually pumping water out of the ground and then putting it back. All those previous systems, you're not pumping water at all. You're only circulating a fluid around it, around like a radiator. Um, open loop systems do require that you have this thing sticking up in your yard. <laughs> this is a well cap. Um, some people don't like the look of those. Um, this is one downside of that kind of system. So here's an example of, um, it's a real world example of an 1800 square foot house that we retrofit. Um, it had an existing hot air furnace. And we took the furnace out and we put a geothermal system right in its place. Um, it was a $35,000 job before incentives. They got a $10,500 federal tax credit. They got $6,650 from the Mass Clean Energy Center as a cash back rebate, which went directly to the homeowner. Um, they got credits from the Department of Energy Resources, and they were able to finance the balance uh, with a massive heat loan at 0% financing.
Um, one nice thing about a forced air or central air system is that you can add accessories onto the system. Um, so for example, we install a lot of smart thermostats if you like to control your heating and air conditioning from your phone. You can add a humidification system, you can add high grade filter, HEPA filter, UV uh, treatments. Um, you can add a fresh air system to bring fresh air into your home. And you can also, um, if you're a techie, you can add monitoring system to your ground source heat pump so you can see what the ground loop temperature is, you can see how much electricity it's using. Um, there's all kinds of um, accessories you can add. And with that, there's our contact information if you'd like to contact us. Um, you can reach us through, directly through our website or through the Heat Smart program. Or you can email us as well. Thanks. So at this time, we're going to be doing another round of questions. So if you have a question, put your hand up. Or if you're in, your, if you're in the back, you're going to need to come out to the aisles. So just let's go. This is a first. <laughs> <laughs> So you mentioned that uh, you have to have a ducted system essentially uh, for for the uh, geothermal heat pump. Yeah. Can did, can that work with a high velocity, um, the, you know, the the, the, the small um, tube high velocity ducts for the, that type the, of air conditioning system? The short answer is no. <laughs> The long answer is it's very complicated. <laughs> uh, we could, the only way to do that is hydronically. So we make hot water like a like a hydro air kind of system. But the the unless unless the system is already grossly oversized, you're not going to get good heat out of it. If we're only feeding 120 or 130 degree water to it, it really needs to be sized for that right from the beginning. So I can get into the nitty gritty of it with you outside if you like. But with but with standard ductwork for you know a hot air furnace or air conditioner, generally that would work. Yes. Just out of curiosity, from your estimate, what percentage of homes in Winchester or Arlington would potentially be suitable for this system? I guess what I'm saying is that already have a ducted uh, heating and air conditioning system. How many homes already have a ducted like what system? What Gosh, I have no idea. If I was to guess, I'd say 30%. Is ledge a problem? Ledge, no problem. We go right through it. We want to hit ledge. I have a question. Um, okay. <laughs> are is there a, a size of house that is applicable? Like, is this more for bigger houses? What's the kind of the main thing? No, it, it's good for any size house. And when you actually get really small, the percentage of the project that is covered by rebates is actually much higher. Once you get down around uh, 1,500 square feet or less. All right. If you come across any other questions that you're thinking about, we'll have more time after our presentations. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Gallery. Um, I'm the pedal boiler installer. We are uh, located in um, Burlington, the office in Burlington, and the warehouse is in uh, Belgica. Uh, the first two slides is just a, a quick overview of uh, the activities we do. Um, so obviously we install biomass, pedal boilers, uh, 
and cheap oils, also getting into biomass combined helium power. Um, this is something that's coming. Um, similar to solar PV, uh, purchase, power purchase agreement, so it's probably in the pipeline for the future with, uh, with heat. Uh, we can sell heat to uh, the microphone, sorry. Um, this is kind of the, regio, uh, the regions where we are active, uh, New England, West Coast, uh, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and then also in the Midwest and a little bit in the uh, eastern part of Canada. These are the brands uh, we represent. For the Heat Smart program, it's uh, the Windhager uh, pellet boilers. We are uh, promoting and I think uh, extremely good pricing on. And the other brands is uh, Asma Blue Chip, uh, Boiler Stunner, Combined Heat and Power, Workhard, uh, same CHP but with wood pellets. And these are Alaska uh, um, Hot Air furnaces, uh, wood chip fueled. This is uh, the residential model on the Mintag. We have them in two colors, red and green. And with Christmas, we can have the green one with the red dots. <laughs> it's the bigger brother, Excel, up to 200,000 BTU. You can cascade them. This is the general concept of a pellet boiler uh, system. So, we have the house. We need a bulk pellet storage. This is the pellet board. This is the thermal storage tank. It's basically a battery of hot water. And then from this tank, the hot water goes into the house, typically baseboard, uh, floor heat, or uh, warm air. So the truck shows up, just like an oil truck but it has pellets on board, it, blow, it blows the pellets into the bin. A little bit about the pellets, the wood pellets. So, they are dried and densified wood residues. Uh, there is no binders or other additives involved. It's just uh, compression of this, yeah, uh, basically fine sawdust to form the pellets. I do have some uh, bags here with uh, with samples, you can pass them around, please. Thank you. Um, everybody is familiar with the bagged pellets. So this is a 40-pound bag. We also have them in 20. This is when they are stacked in uh, a ton, typically 50 bags. But uh, our system, you're not going to touch these pellets anymore. It is, it is the truck. Truck comes around. This is a pellet truck. Uh, the pellet truck, truck has a four inch holes. Uh, they can go up to 80 or 85 feet. That's a little bit of limitation, so the truck will need to be able to get to within that distance to the fill point on the house. This is an example. And then um, the truck just blows the pellets into the bin. It's not going to blow it in the basement. There is a bin behind this point. Um, this is the bulk bin. This is the fill point and there is a vent. And then what the boiler does is um, when the day hopper is empty, so there is no pellets in the day hopper, uh, the controller, control board says, okay, suck pellets out of the bin into the day hopper. The distance between these two here can be up to 80 feet. This is a custom uh, built bin, three probes, three suction probes. This is a fabric bin uh, for installation within typically a basement or within the house, garage. This is an outside bin. If for instance, the basement has not a lot, enough uh, headroom, we can do an outside installation, one probe, and then we need to be within the 80 feet again. 
uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 80 feet to the to the pedal boiler. How it functions? So that's the pedal boiler. This is the thermal storage tank, and this is your house heat distribution system. So the thermal storage tank is in charge. It tells the boiler to fire or not to fire. Basically, it's a big battery of hot water. All the hot water is stored in here. And then when the house needs heat, it just uh, takes heat out of that tank uh, by means of circulators, circulating the water uh, in the baseboard or in your floor uh, heating system. Uh, this is the kind of the inside of the boiler, a close-up. Uh, so the machine, the residential boiler is about 70 inches high, so that's the height we need in the basement. Normally it's no problem, but sometimes the basement is uh, not high enough, then it will not work. Um, the cross section here is, so this is the uh, day hopper, that's the vacuum, uh, sucks the pellets from the dog bin into this day hopper. The auger, augers the pellets into the burn pot, this is the burn pot. Um, it's automatically cleaned, it shakes out the ashes in the, bur in, in the bottom, the ashes drop down here. There is an auger system that uh, moves the ashes into that box here on the podium. That's the ash bin. It uh, holds ashes for two to three tons of pellets burned, so you typically empty it two, three times a year for an average size house. Also, the heat exchanger cleaning, uh, I'm going to go to this that bigger slide. So the heat exchanger cleaning is the same there, uh, the, the fly ash falls down and there is a second arbor in the back brings again these ashes in that box. Uh, the box has wheels, so you can kind of um, move it fairly easy. It is um, sealed, you can bring it to your uh, yard for the vegetable garden or for the flowers or so. Thank you, Andy. A little bit about the BTU or the cost, so the comparative cost of the heating. So it's, it's the numbers here. The dollar amount is for uh, 1 million BTU. Natural gas are around uh, uh, typically around uh, 15, 16, oil around 30, propane just under 40. So traditional, uh, right now, wood pellets at 260 a ton. Your 17, 18 dollars for 1 million BTU. With the alternative energy credits, it brings it uh, down to like uh, 13, 14. So that's the state uh, credits so per ton of pellets uh, you consume. The state gives a kickback between 70 to 80 dollars. It's kind of a value that's not fixed. Uh, this is an overview of oil costs. Um, versus wood pellet cost. So the green line is the cost of wood pellets, the other line is um, oil. Um, so it, wood pellets does not have that uh, those spikes. Uh, very expensive or, or very cheap, so it's more stable. I'm going to give an overview now of uh, residential pricing. It's for the heat smart program here. So the average installed cost of a pellet boiler residential under the Mass CC program is around 27,000. Uh, this is my company's pricing between 25, 24 and 25 and a half. We have a special offer, it's a, it's a kick start. Uh, we do one boiler in each of the towns at this cost, only one in each of the towns. And then the regular cost for the program here is uh, on the screen right now, so it's about a 13, uh, sorry, a 30 percent discount compared to our average cost. On on that regular cost for the heat smart, there will be a 40 percent rebate from Mass CEC. So this is the dollar amount that represents the 40 percent. So this is your final homeowner cost, and this amount can be financed with the mass with 
MSA fee law. So that brings it, and these are the monthly uh, amounts over seven years. Just to give you an idea of involved cost. Uh, some pictures on systems here. This is a residential one, um, typical water you know, here, with a bookshelf, and normally there's also some wine racks and beer. <laughs> Um, this before, this is after. So, um, this tank, that's your uh, thermal storage tank. This one has a domestic hot water coil integrated, so it has both functions, not just a thermal storage tank, but it also prepares your domestic hot water. And then this is just an example of a bigger installation. It's a wood chip water. Uh, this is what they make. Uh, wooden rowing machines, they have a lot of um, waste of this production. They grind it up and use it to heat. So it's the same thing, boiler, bigger thermal storage tank, piping, insulation, a, a, bigger, a bigger storage, uh, a bigger uh, ash bin. It's like your uh, Trash can, it's the same but in, in metal galvanized. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much. All, all the literature here, and you, you know, talks about if you have oil, propane, or electric. So if you have a very old gas boiler, this, what are the pros and cons of replacing it with an efficient? Gas versus doing this. Natural gas or propane? Natural gas. Um, so, pros, it's the renewable aspect compared to nat uh, natural gas. Um, price wise, with or after the alternative energy credits, you're going to be a little bit cheaper than natural gas, but not much. So, it's financially, it's not going to be a big saving, but it's, it's, it's the renewable. <coughs> Did you say the source of the wood pellets is completely waste, or is there some element of uh, 80 to 90 percent of forestry? 80 to 90 percent is wood waste, and the balance is sourced from forestry or uh, urban waste wood when there's a storm clean up of, of that stuff, of that material. Um, do you need a regular chimney for this, or does this vent through the side of the house? Sorry, say it again? Do you use a regular chimney for this, or does this vent through the side of the house like the high efficiency gas heaters do? Uh, so it's not, you, you need a chimney, it can be a brick, or can be an, uh, a metal class A uh, chimney or if the brick, the chimney is in bad condition, we put a liner in. But you need a chimney. Um, we don't recommend uh, with a power venter uh, for the simple reason if electric goes off or there's a mechanical issue or an electrical issue, then the smoke may enter your basement. So uh, we stepped away from that. Chimney is the safest and also uh, the best because the performance of the machine is uh, is very reliable than with a natural draft chimney. I actually have one last question. Um, what kind of existing infrastructure in a house make modern wood heat a good idea? Yeah, so you need uh, an existing baseboard hydraulic system with traditional oil boiler and to three zones and a, an indirect uh, domestic hot water heater that can be right away converted to a pellet water. All right, thank you. Hi, my name is John Moore. I'm with New England Solar Hot Water. This is the last technology you'll be happy to hear. Um, we were really excited about this program, working with uh, the town volunteers and uh, NAF CEC. Um, we've worked together before on programs that are similar. There have been some very successful programs on, for solar 
photovoltaics or electric systems. Um, but here we're talking about solar hot water. And in our case, um, the panels are usually for most houses just two or three panels to supply the heat that's necessary for domestic hot water. So you can see um, in our case, as opposed to solar electric, it's a couple of panels look, look pretty much like a couple of large skylights on your roof. Um, so before I talk too much about the systems, I just want to talk about us a little bit. We're a um, small local company, 10 employees. Um, we've been in business 12 years. We have um, uh, over 500 systems in place right now. Um, licensed contractors and plumbers. We kind of really emphasize our customer service and high quality at, at really competitive pricing. Um, our main players is Bruce Dyke. He's our president. I'm not the president. Um, here's Bruce here. He's a definitely hands-on guy. He's at every installation, designs every large installation. I'm an architect. I do marketing and sales. I'll be doing the SAID assessments and the original system designs for residential. And we also have uh, Beverly Jacoby, who's our customer service person. She's, I think she's here, or she might be at the table, but she's, she's here somewhere. Um, and she's kind of the face when you first come into our, our, our company, and also when you finish with the installation. She'll introduce you to the company and also finish up on uh, permitting at the end of the installation, make sure you get your rebates and all your incentives that are available, which are numerous for our systems. Uh, we're definitely the leader in the state. We have, um, as I said, over 500 residential systems operating right now, 50 or more large commercial systems, and lots of customers. You can talk to them, systems you can see to, to make you feel comfortable with the technology. Uh, I put this slide in just as a basic to, to just uh, give the basic understanding of how it works. This is not converting solar energy to electricity. It's a much more efficient process of just taking the sun's heat, as you are well aware when you touch your dashboard on any kind of sunny day, winter and summer, how hot your dashboard can get. That's basically the idea, and we're transferring that heat through a, um, through a pipe and transferring it with liquid to um, your hot water tank. <coughs> the collectors we uh, install are two types right now on the market. The more standard type is the flat plate collector, which is just as I described. There's a big absorber plate, absorber plate underneath the glass, which is like the dashboard of your car. Um, and then pipes attached to that plate, which will transfer that heat to fluid. Um, this can get very, very hot, up over 200 degrees. Um, and there's also another type that is um, a newer technology. Um, where there are these glass tubes with little miniature absorber plates in them. Um, these do a little bit better in winter, a little more expensive. They do a little bit better in winter because they're so well insulated. It's a vacuum tube, each of those glass tubes. Um, just a, a, an overview, solar thermal has been around a long, long time, of course. Um, in its current, current design with these flat plate collectors, it's been uh, around for 50 years or so. This is 1979, Jimmy Carter putting solar thermal collectors on the White House. Um, we are just now, this was a, a kind of a bump in solar hot water interest, and we're just now taking down systems that were installed in the early 80s um, that have lasted that long. The collectors today are not much different from these collectors. They were 75 to 80% efficient then. They're still 75 to 80% efficient, and they're um, basically the same design. Um, in the Northeast, we do mainly domestic hot water, and I was talking to someone outside beforehand. People, a lot of people ask about space heating for solar thermal, and it, it can be done. We've done quite a few systems for people that want combination domestic hot water and space heating, um, but it's got to be someone who has a very high budget and not looking for a quick payback mainly because, as you can see here, if you're looking at uh, heat needed for um, space heating as well as domestic hot water, you can see summer in the middle here, you can see much more need in the winter months, while our solar resource is much higher in the summer months. So if we wanted to design a system to take in these, uh, these usage, we would have to add a whole bunch of collectors, make a very large system, and it would be way oversized for six or nine months of the year. So 
payback isn't great on, on space heating, so we mainly concentrate on domestic hot water. Uh, this is a typical system, um, our basic system, which is if someone has a domestic hot water tank existing that's in good shape, um, we can install a solar system next to it and simply preheat the water going to the existing tank. So the existing tank, instead of receiving cold water from the street, would receive preheated water and most of the year wouldn't even go on, but sometimes in the winter might back up the solar. What we've got is the collectors on the roof. We have a closed loop of fluid that goes up to the collectors, pumped around through a heat exchanger to a solar tank. This is your battery. This is your battery of solar thermal. And then your cold water from the street comes into the solar tank, out and then to the existing tank. That's the basic setup, most least expensive setup that we offer. We also offer a one tank solution. If your existing tank has about had it or you're looking for alternative backups rather than your existing, you want to change fuels or looking at alternatives, we can do a solar tank which has integrated electric element for backup or it can have a coil connected to your boiler for backup. So the solar tank would be like any indirect tank. Um, one key thing to see here is our systems are what we call drain back, meaning the fluid that goes up to the collectors drains into this small tank here when the system is not operating. So the collectors are free of fluid and can't overheat or, or freeze um, because it's sitting here. This is also a non-pressurized loop, so there's no need to keep it at a perfect pressure, so it's a less, much less maintenance than um, older systems. That has been the one change uh, since the early days that's really helped. The tanks we use are not like a normal hot water tank. They're stainless steel, they're lifetime warranty, they're as durable as the rest of the system, so they're meant to last 25 years plus. Um, these are made in Massachusetts. It's a great company. Heat transfer products, HTP. You might know the brand name Superstore. They make um, indirect tanks for boilers. is the biggest part of their business. And they also make solar tanks. Uh, the piping between is a lot like air source heat pumps that you saw in Joe's presentation. Uh, pipes are similarly sized. We can run pipes inside the house if they're stacked attics or if there's a space where we can run the pipes or we can go down the outside and, and cover in a, the slim duct pipe cover as well. Um, our, uh, this is probably one of Joe's systems actually. <laughs> um, our roof penetrations people ask about the uh, flashing of the roof mounts and of the piping is, is very tried and true. It's the same systems that are used by uh, PV installers nationwide and worldwide. Um, we just don't have problems with roof leaks, so it's not something to worry about. We do offer a lot of numbers here, I'm sorry, I apologize, but we do offer monitoring. If you're interested, you can have uh, online monitoring where you can go online and look at your system and see what it's doing, see temperatures in the tank and the collectors, and also look at a history of the output from the system and um, what it's done over the last 7, 30 days or longer. Uh, maintenance is really minimal. Um, the solar fluid in that solar loop is something that probably should be checked every five to seven years, but as I said, it's not pressurized, so it's not important to keep it right at a certain pressure or a certain pH level uh, constantly, so that's something we recommend. Uh, the pump is really the only moving part, this little pump here. Um, that uses very little energy. It's about as much as a light bulb when it's running, which is a couple hours a day, depending on how much hot water you use. And um, that may need to be replaced during the life of the system. But otherwise, it's built to last a uh, full 20 to 25 years. Um, more confusing part of our, of our offer is the, is the incentives. The, the system is pretty simple. The incentives are kind of complex, and um, but in a nutshell, um, this is a, a graph showing a, a smaller system for family of one to four with two collectors, larger uh, three collectors, family of four to six. We have system price, then we have a, a cash rebate from the Mass CEC, and this would be the out-of-pocket cost from the customer, and that's the amount that could be put on a heat loan at zero percent. Then after the system's installed, there's a, installed, there's a series of incentives that come to you. 
Um, first is the, these are from Mass Department of Energy Resources, the alternative energy certificates, worth, depending on the size of the system, they're worth a certain amount, that's one check that comes six months after the system is installed. Then you get your federal tax credit, like you do for all solar systems, and then there's a Massachusetts tax credit as well. So you can see the net cost is around $2,000, depending on uh, the size, and it doesn't change much between small to large because the incentives get higher if your system is larger. And of course, there's a cap, though you can only go so far with that. I just show this because the rebate, I, I want to show that the rebate, it's great, it's more generous for uh, lower and moderate income families. So if you get to moderate income between 80 and 120% of the median, uh, the rebate gets increased and gets increased again if you get to uh, lower income. So that's a nice offering. The heat loan um, that's been uh, talked about, 0% interest, seven year term. With one of our systems, if you take out the heat loan and pay off that initial out of pocket, and then start paying it down once you get these additional incentives within six months or a year. Your net cost is positive right, right, out, of the, right out of the box in the second year. And you're, um, even though you have loan payments, you have enough savings to make up for that and more. And so you're cash positive right away. This is um, the numbers I was talking about before. I just wanted to talk about uh, what kind of heat is produced by these systems. It's surprisingly a lot. People, uh, families, depending on the family size, spend a lot more energy on hot water than they think sometimes, especially in a very energy efficient house where, you're, where your space heating is very efficient. Um, here we have a three collector system that's producing uh, almost 16 million BTUs and that offsets a lot more because your existing system is not as efficient, so it's, it's keeping your, efficient, your existing system from producing that much, so it's saving uh, that much. And for a typical oil heat system, we've got a 22% cash um, return on your investment. And this little system here is equivalent in CO2 savings to uh, over one and a half acres of forest, so that's kind of nice to know. Um, just a quick graph on the modern income. Again, those same numbers here, your net cost is well under $1,000. These are the income levels that qualify. You can see a, a household size of three um, under 107,000 would qualify for the higher rebate. And now some uh, pretty pictures of sort of all these numbers. We we um, like to look at houses that have been kind of rejected by the PV installers because we can usually find a small roof space somewhere that gets enough sun and still um, are able to install a system that works well. So if you've been rejected by PV, please talk to us. We'll still, we'll still take a look and maybe find a spot. We also do uh, mounting on, because it's just a couple collectors, we can mount on the wall or we can tilt up on a flat roof. Um, you can find all kinds of spots. It's nice to do uh, an awning mount sometimes because it might shade a window that might be getting too much sun in the summer. Um, we also have quite a few customers that have done PV and they want to do more. Expanding their PV system is difficult, if not impossible, and expensive. Um, so sometimes we'll mount uh, in other space that's available, even on the north facing roof, and tilt our collectors back towards south. Um, on that note of, of some people ask about expanding their PV for and just using PV to heat uh, electric hot water heater, and that's very possible. If you're putting in PV, um, sometimes we will do the numbers and, and it looks like it might make sense to just expand your PV system when you're putting it in. If you already have a PV system, though, expanding is usually difficult and expensive, and the numbers usually are not even near comparable. It does take a lot more roof space with PV to create the same amount of heat. Um, just a few photos of commercial systems, small commercial systems we've done, um, showing the different ways that we can mount. This is a um, condominium in Port Square, Cambridge, dorms at Harvard, apartment building um, with awning mount collectors. Those are evacuated tubes, awning mount, and a pool. And we 
also do very large systems. Um, this is UMass Amherst and an apartment building in Boston. Same idea, tanks are just larger, more collectors, larger tanks, but same basic idea. Um, as I said, we have a lot of customers. We'll be giving referrals if you, if you ask for them, and we're happy to uh, introduce you to some of our customers. And that's all. Thank you. We have time for a few questions for the solar hot water. Just a quick question. Um, the panels get really hot. Did that transfer into the house, into the attic, into the living space? Uh, yeah, uh, good question. Um, no, the, the, what happens is that the fluid that goes up in the panel also gets very hot. And it goes down into the solar storage tank and gets transferred into that water, which is a very insulated tank. So the water is the only thing that heats up. And we usually put a set point at that. Uh, in that water, so the, the tank is not going to reach up to 200 degrees, it's going to reach up to whatever point, set point actually you and we decide. Usually around 140 degrees, it's still hotter than your traditional hot water tank because it's free energy, we want to we keep it. Um, and then we mix it with coal, we have a mixing valve that mixes it with coal before it gets delivered to your fixtures, so there's no scalding. Uh, just two quick ones. Um, what percentage do most of their total heating, right, with uh, heating the home and hot water? What percentage of their bill is typically for hot water? Do you have a rough estimate of how much you know of your total? Um, yeah, it's changing. You know, it used to be in the in the twenty percent range, but it's been changing because everybody's getting more efficient with their with their space heating. So now it's uh, they're estimating the thirty percent range. Uh, it depends. Every house is different. You know, you have a real inefficient house with wind blowing through it. Your heating bill might be huge. Or small, but, but we can estimate the amount you're spending on hot water depending on what fuel you're using. We can estimate that based on your family size. And, and then just in, in the wintertime, what percentage is the backup used to get the heat, the hot water hot water? Yeah, um, that depends on the size that you choose, but typically we design systems to offer 50% of, of your hot water by solar in the dead of winter. So it would be 100% in the summer. 75 to, eight, sorry, 75 to 80 percent spring and fall, and then in the dead of winter, maybe 50 percent. Instead of designing for 100 percent in the winter, where it would be way oversized in the summer, we try to kind of strike a balance. Are there any questions over on this side? I'm kind of hanging out over there. So if you've got a house with uh, electric panels already pretty much filling up the south-facing roof, you said that you could get enough solar uh, input on the north-facing yeah. roof? Yeah, but we have to tilt the panels back at least towards south. They don't have to be due south, but they can be you know, southeast or even due west or east. Um, but they would be tilted up, so they don't look great, and be honest, they look like you know, a satellite dish up there. But if it's in a real roof where you can't see it much, or in the backyard or something, um, we, we do that often. How about garage roof? Yeah, garage roof's great. Yeah, we, we can trench between the buildings, if necessary, with the piping. So, yeah, possible. Yeah, uh, snow, it's like PV, um, snow is, is going to cover them, and when it covers them, you're not going to get any production. Um, it does tend to come off of solar therm a little faster than PV because of the warming factor. If they just have a little opening at all, you know, it'll warm up immediately and they'll come off. But um, again, it's during the winter time when we're providing not a lot. If you look at your production for the whole year, there's not that much during that January three or four weeks when we have snow covering, so you're not losing a lot for the year, but you're depending on backup when they're covered in snow. Yeah, yeah uh, sorry, I, I just wanted to recap that. In other words, 
um, if you have an east or, or west facing roof, yeah. you're saying that you will have to till? East, if, it's, if it's direct east or west, it might work and we can combine, take a measurement, it might be fine. Okay. Uh, we might add another collector to give you a little more production. If it's, if, but if it's northerly in any way, either northeast or north or northwest, then we'd have to tilt them. Okay, I think, so I think if it's, it's, but like if it's due, due east to due west. west. <laughs> Yours is what? I think it's due east west. Due east west, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll be happy to come out and check it out for you. Yeah. All right, I think we should move on to the next portion of the event. Fritz, did you want to say anything? Or? Just that if we have some general questions, um, we can have take a little more time for that. Um, Andy's happy to bring the microphone. So just, are there any more questions? These can be questions for any technology or for all the installers, mm -hmm. whatnot. Or also our uh, center for um, our Mass CEC representative. If you have a two family, as we do, would you qualify for the program for two installations, or would it just be one installation per family? Is that for any particular technology, or? Um, uh, it would have to be the ductless, because we don't have ducts. And the ductless mini splits? Okay, yeah. so would it qualify as one or two? So, uh, on, I'll speak first uh, for Mass EC rebates, uh, although our we're not currently offering rebates for ductless heat pumps. Uh, we treat each residential unit as a separate unit, um, and mass safe similarly. We, we, if, if, especially if there's two electric meters, um, it would be two units. Any other questions? Just with the solar hot water, what condition does your roof have to be in? Of the roof. Or do you need a new roof? If you think you're going to need a new roof. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not as much of an issue as it is with PV because we're not covering the whole roof. It's not difficult to take the collectors off and put them back on again. You know, if you're thinking of changing five years from now, um, I would encourage you to do it this year with these incentives. Um, but if you're thinking of changing this year, you know, it might save a little bit. Um, we charge around five hundred to seven hundred dollars to take the to take two visits, come and take them off, and then come back and put them back on again. So. And if you need a new um, water heater this year, should you get a new water heater and then put in the solar next year? Um, if you need a new water heater this year, we can we can put the tank in. And you're thinking of doing solar hot water? Um, you could sign up with us, and we can get the tank changed out immediately, like if it's leaking now. We could be out there this week and change out the tank so you've got your solar ready tank in, and then we go through the paperwork and the, the time it takes to, to get the rest of the system installed. I don't know if that answers your question, but if you wait till next year, the incentives are changing. The, the federal tax credit's going down, the rebates are going down, everything is, is lowering, so it'd be good to do it this year if you're interested. Another question? Um, I'd be interested in some feedback on just like the holistic uh, situation where you now I have a home with a gas-fired hot water heater, about 15 years old, so it's nearing the end of its life. Bench up the chimney, I have a gas boiler, uh, hydronic heat system, also about 20 years old, cast iron boiler. Um, we don't have air conditioning in the house, but we like central air conditioning. Which, what should we do? Ah, good question. Eeny, meeny, meeny, meeny. Um, anybody want to start with that one? Meg, I was going to say, you're probably impartial. Uh, why don't I start since I don't work for any one particular technology, um, but support all of them. Um, I think, uh, well, first I'll, I'll just generic plug to, you know, not specific to your situation, but I think all these installers are happy to have, um, you know, to at least start off with phone calls and kind of talk some options through. If anything, they said tonight sparked, oh, maybe, you know, for your hot water needs, it might be a good solar hot water, you know, I'm sure they'd each be happy to have a further conversation with you. And I think that applies more, more broadly. If you think, um, even if you're not quite sure if the technology is right for you, they're all happy to, to talk to you. Um, so, um, uh, I'll, 
I'm not in Starbucks, I'm not recommending a particular situation uh, for you, and I, I do think you should talk to everyone. Um, you know, if you, uh, well, just the last thing you mentioned that you uh, want cooling, um, you know, that would be provided by the two heat pump technologies that are here, um, although it sounds like you don't have existing ductwork, duct work, um, so it might be a little bit of a harder fit for ground source heat pump, uh, based on what Melanie's said tonight. Um, uh, the existing gas boiler you have could work with modern wood heating, you could even combine modern wood heating and air source heat pump. Um, uh, modern wood heating does also provide hot water, um, and then of course solar hot water would potentially serve your, your hot water needs. So I haven't given you a full answer, but that's kind of uh, off the top of my head, and uh, others are welcome to chime in, I, especially if I misrepresented any of your technologies. That actually brings up, I think he was bringing up the point when he said holistic. Basically, what we have, we have all these different technologies here. And yeah, you're going after each one independently, and maybe that's, that works most of the time. But, you know, is there any agency you could go to, or a contractor, or whatever, or to you know, recommend somebody who would come in and say, well, this, this is what we should do overall to get the best results across all the stuff, or can you just treat it independently, and that's great, yeah, I don't know. So this program is set up to kind of speak to each installer based on, you know, which of the technology or multiple technologies sparks your interest. Um, but if you want to reach out to either um, Fritzy here in, in Winchester, or we live in Arlington, uh, Andy, and, you know, kind of start feeding some questions through them, um, you know, ultimately we're going to connect you with the installers, but we have the expertise of, of them and us at Mass EC, as well as a technical consultant that's supporting this program that can kind of help answer some preliminary questions for you. Uh, and then the first thing, in terms of holistically serving your home, that you want to start with is, is that home energy assessment and, and getting the efficiency data first. Uh, and the website that they've put together, the HeatSmart uh, Arlington Winchester, also has some great resources to help you think about the pros and cons of each technology and how it might fit in with your home. All right, do we have any more last standing questions? For the home energy assessment, um, how do we sign up for that? And are there different companies and do they all offer the same thing or is it depend on the company? Um, Good question. So the easiest way to sign up is to go to MassSave.com, um, and there are two general pathways uh, after that, and they'll, they'll both be on the MassSave.com website. Um, there's the kind of uh, standard MassSave uh, home energy auditors, and they it's a company called Clear Result that currently has that contract, and they'll come out to your home, do no-cost energy assessment, um, and then if they recommend measures like weatherization or air sealing, uh, they'll then um, give you those recommendations, but they don't actually do them. They'll connect you with people who do do them. Um, and then there's a home performance contractor is the second major pathway who uh, will come and give basically the same no cost home energy assessment, uh, which is designed by MassSave to whether it's through Clear Result or through a home performance contractor to include the same features. Um, but the home performance contractor will then offer other services, um, potentially including weatherization and air sealing. Um, so some people like to work with home performance contractor with the idea they might see you all the way through the project. Some people would prefer clear results, it's more neutral, they're not trying to sell you any other services. Um, so you know, either one's a good option. Let's see, I'm gonna pass it back off to you. So I think it's probably a good time for us to break out and um, have the opportunity to speak individually with the installers. When you came in, you saw that the tables were set up um, for each uh, installer. So I invite you to head out there. And we also have some goodies from Foodlink, who is a wonderful organization based in Arlington who rescue do food rescue. Um, they've provided some goodies for us tonight, not because they're rescuing us and we need them, but just so you have an idea of the kind of work they do, and there's some information out there. So thank you again for coming tonight, and we hope to hear some more from you. Thanks. Bye-bye.